Good evening. Hi. Hi. Hello. Just changing my background effects. I'll be right there. Okay, Julie, no problem. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, Anne. Hi, Emily. Hi, Juan. Hi, Juan. Um, Emily? Yes. I had two inquiries about from people wanting to attend the meeting and one who wanted to speak. I haven't heard a follow up from either one. So I've given them everything they need to connect. So maybe they'll show up as attendees and then we can ask them if they want to speak. Okay, sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi, Juan. Hi, Juan. How are you? Good evening. Good. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Nice. How was San Francisco? It's good. I'm going back in about, um, I'm going back on the 10th. Great. <laughs> like, take it all down and uh, start again. <laughs> sure, that's a big job. It, it is. But, but, it, but it's nicely compensated, which I was happy about. You Great. Know? Um, you know, it was a really nice contribution for that show that I was a part of. And uh, um, I was happy to do it because it was my opportunity to really see, you know, and like uh, step back and um, um, yeah, just have a good look of like uh, the things that I've, uh, that, I've uh, that I've done. That's great. Yeah, yeah, super happy about it. Good evening, Ty. Nice to see you. Hi, Emily. How are you? Good. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. Okay, let's see here. Bring up my agenda. Juan Miguel, do you have the agenda that you can find because the land acknowledgement is at the bottom of it and I was wondering if you'd be willing to read the land acknowledgement tonight? I'd be happy to do that. I'm looking at it right now, actually. Great, thank you. Shall I start? Yeah. Shall we start? No, no, we have to wait until we have number one, a quorum, and number two, it's actually five o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's and number three, Joe Lassard. Right. I could start without him, Ty, because you're not um, right up top of the agenda. So. so I just want to make sure you got the link. Yes. OK. See you next, uh, we're on, so anytime. Bye. OK, that's me, right? No, hold off. Hold off one. Okay, because we don't have we don't have a quorum yet. We have to have one more person. Okay, okay, sounds good. Okay, we're waiting on Angela and um, Emily. What do you know about Precious? Will she be in attendance? Oh, there Here she, she is. is. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Wait a minute before we get started. Let's find out how yeah. uh, how Precious is doing. How are you doing, Precious? Okay, recovering. I just have sunglasses on. Not to um, look. I don't know. I just you didn't find the Zoom link in I, I uh, your email. Bright light right now, but okay. Thank you. All right, I'm not seeing Angela. Or I other talked people. to. Well, I texted with Tina. Angela today. Are you okay? Coming. Okay. I'll, I want to talk to you before you leave. Though, okay. Okay. Pardon me. All right. Let's wait and see who Ann Seltzer no. is talking to. No, we're on Zoom. Angela should be coming. Progress. Don't Here's see the Angela. one that you got from Zoom. Angela I say is the under one my name, you. though. That's weird. But Angela, are you signed in as is Angela um, signed in as an attendee or as a 
Um, <laughs> I'm thinking of science administration. <laughs> Angela, you might be able to just change your name on there. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Maybe because you see, I sent you the link or something. Yeah, let's see. Hi, President Bailey. I see you. Nice to see you. Hi, Hi Precious. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Hello. Okay. Hey, Angela. Hey. Hi. Okay. Hi. All right. Bye. Hi, Hi Joe. Joe. Thank I see Joe. It's, it's nice to see you. Thank you. Um, uh, so, Gina will uh, be here in just, she is uh, almost yeah, here. Yeah. Hey, Julia. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to get started because we have a we have a quorum and because it's five o'clock. So I'm going to get started. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Emily Simon, and I want to thank you all for coming uh, tonight to the meeting of the Social Equity and Racial Justice Advisory Committee for the City of Ashland. Um, hello, Tammy. Nice to see you, she said, without breaking stride. Um, and... Uh, we're going to start this meeting tonight, as we always do, with a, a land acknowledgement, which will be read by Juan Santiago. But before you do that, Juan, just because we have a lot of other people who are here tonight and a lot of invited guests, if people could just go around and say their name, even though the names are at the bottom of the Zoom screen, uh, I would appreciate it just so everybody could know who's in the Zoom room together. Um, I've gone first, I've already identified myself. Uh, why don't we just go around the room and you're next on my screen. Hi everyone, I'm Ann Seltzer. I'm the staff liaison to this uh, committee. Hi everybody, my name is Juan Santiago and um, I am one of the newest members in this uh, commission. Happy to be here and happy to Okay, I think Juan just froze a little bit. There he oh, goes. Oh, I did. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Let me, uh, right. shall I reintroduce myself? No, we got it. We got it. Um, and then Precious, you're next on my screen as I go around. Hi, everybody. I'm Precious Yamaguchi, the co-chair of our committee. I had eye surgery. That's why I'm wearing sunglasses. So not to look cool or unprofessional, but hello, everybody. Nice to see you. Hi. Um, hey, everybody, Ty O'Meara, Ashland Police Chief. Happy to be here. And Julie Gillis. Hi there, Julie Gillis. Pronouns are she and hers. Nice to meet you all. See you all. Joe. I'm Joe Lassard, City Manager. Although on my screen it says I'm Ann Seltzer, but you know, that's the luck of the draw, I guess. <laughs> Angela? Um, hi, everybody. I'm Angela Decker. And um, like Juan, I'm also very new to this group. So nice to see everybody. President Bailey. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Rick, uh, president here at, at Southern Oregon University and honored to be with you tonight. Thanks for having me. Tammy. Hi everyone, I'm Tamara Williams. I also go by Tammy. I currently work as an educational assistant and the Black Student Union um, Assistant Director over at Ashland Middle School. And this is my second year here being on the committee. So welcome to all the new people. Welcome Angela, welcome Juan. I wasn't here in the last meeting and thank you everyone for coming out. And Gina, you're last. Hello everybody, Gina Duquesne, I'm Ashland City Councilor and the liaison to this committee. And I'd like to welcome our new members. I'm excited to see you and I look forward to working with, with everyone. Thank you. So thank you everybody for that, for your introductions and Juan, uh, go ahead if you would please tonight and read the land acknowledgement. Sounds good. Let me, um, I just kind of like uh, lost it for a second here. Let me just pull it back up. Oh no, I don't know what's going on. Sorry. Here we are. You, oh, there you got it. Go ahead, one. Yeah, yeah, I think I do. Uh, it's land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and honor the Aboriginal people on whose ancestral homelands we work. 
the Ikirakutsum band of the Shasta Nation, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home here today. We denounce the egregious acts of the colonizer and government and recognize the horrific impacts that still exist today. We honor the first stewards in the Rogue Valley and the lands we love and depend on. Tribes with ancestral lands in and surrounding the geography of the Ashland watershed include the original past, present, and future indigenous inhabitants of the Shasta, the Kelma, Atabascan people. We also recognize and acknowledge the Shasta village, Quahaka, Haha, where the crow lights that is now the Ashland City Plaza. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there, do I, we need next to do the approval of minutes from October 6, 2022. Is there anybody who wants to make a motion regarding the minutes? Do I have a, a motion for approval of them? I motion, motion for approval. Thank you, Tammy. Tammy, just move for approval. Do we have a second? Sorry, second. sorry. Uh, we should have a different mo motion than Tammy since Tammy wasn't at the meeting. Okay. okay. I'll make a motion for approval. Thank you, Precious. Do I have a second for the motion? Julie Gillis. Thank you for seconding it. Is there any discussion regarding the motion for the approval of the minutes? Seeing and hearing none, would everybody who assents to the uh, minutes being approved, please just either stick up your hand or use your little hand icon. Motion carries unanimously, thank you. Um, the next order of business then is public input. And do we have anybody who's doing public input? No, I don't see them uh, showing up as attendees. And I haven't received any further communication from them. So, okay, good. So, what we're going to do now before we hear from uh, from President Bailey, City Manager Lazard, and Police Chief Ty O'Mara, and we thank you all for being here. This agenda item won't take very long before we get to you. Is to just give a, a brief overview for people on what's been going on with the commission and um, what. Precious and I have been working on in the meantime, in the past month and, and a half, or month, excuse me. So it's been a very busy time, as many of you know, for us, uh, having written uh, that so many of you helped put together, and thank you, uh, a very well-received statement that we made uh, regarding the situation that sort of crystallized and came to light over the uh, death threats to Nataki Garrett. And since we uh, made that statement, read it at city council, there's been quite a lot of media attention that was paid to the statement, including in the Ashland News and the Medford Mail Tribune, uh, as well as uh, conversation and emails back and forth between Councillor Duquesne and Mayor Aikens and, and many other people. So I thank all of you who participated in that. There was also a radio interview that we did uh, on, not with Angela, with Jeff Riley, but nonetheless uh, on the Jefferson Exchange. Um, in response to that, uh, is uh, Chief O'Mara uh, had requested to come address us, which is terrific and we welcome you very much, Chief, thank you. Um, as did City Manager Lassard, who has other issues to address and speak with us about. And we welcome you very much. Uh, Joe, and thank you very much for being here. So that has been very busy times for us, uh, as well as, and now I will pass it over to Precious for how Precious has been spending her time um, in addition to participating in both our presentation to the city council and also on the radio. Yeah, Precious. thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. And um, I would like to add that today, I think it was today, because today's my first day back on social media that uh, Nataki Garrett, she posted on her own account, uh, our city statement, a link to our 
statement uh, as a commission. So that's available, you know, show support by liking it if you follow her and she's getting our message out there. There was a lot of positive replies that people put. And so thank you about that, Emily. And yes, we were on the radio together and uh, I gave a statement. We both uh, talked at city council. Uh, Emily, she uh, read our statement and I gave city council an update on the work that we've been doing. I've been really trying to concentrate on recruiting for our commission. And again, thank you to Juan Miguel and Angela Hal Decker for your um, joining and I'm so happy in the ways that it came about and I feel that your wonderful additions to our commission and all, all that you bring with it, your artistic views, JPR, and all of the rest that um, we're so excited to learn about. The new members now have been a bit challenging because one of the members that I was recruiting, uh, it was a little bit before our commission became a committee, uh, they, their pronouns, they, them, uh, wanted to be on our commission, but then they just got accepted into a PhD program in Miami. So mm -hmm. that kind of disrupted our um, hope that they would join and they still want to in the future, but I understand that they are in a PhD program now and that's a big priority. I was... Um, approached by another one who another person who she uh, did all of the planning for the Indigenous Peoples Day at SOU and uh, she was really excited to be part of our commission but unfortunately we found out she's not within residing within the limits of Ashland so I'm sad about that and trying to um, keep her engaged and have us be involved in her projects and initiatives and in ways that we could work with the indigenous uh, nations within our region so we'll still be working with her but um, she lives in talent and then I have one more person that had reached out to Emily and I after we gave our uh, speech at city council and I'm waiting to hear back from her but my point is is that I have people within my network, but I'm really, really interested and also encouraging you to reach out to people within your network and people that you think would be great participants, members of our committee. And so I've been trying to find uh, different people that are willing to do the work enthusiastically and uh, be part of our committee. So keep in touch with me about that. Thank you. Yeah, before I turn it back over to Precious so that we can hear from uh, from Rick Bailey, uh, I, I just want to second something, which is we all have limited networks, ultimately, even though we think that with social media, we've got 5,000 friends, we don't really have 5,000 friends. So if anybody knows someone who you think could participate in this committee with full heart and full throat, please tell them to get in touch with us because uh, we do need to have a full number of people so that we have a quorum every time and we have a robust committee and there's a lot of work to do. Thank you, that's my pitch. Okay, Precious, you're on. Hello, or I'm so excited to welcome President Bailey. I feel that uh, we've been on this journey together a bit as I was on his search committee and uh, just seeing the different uh, steps that he's taken throughout time in transitioning to our community in Ashland and SOU. So I will give him a chance to introduce himself the way that he likes to, but uh, he's a, a person that has different cultural backgrounds, one of those being a veteran. I don't know how many other people are veteran families, but um, I feel connected to him in that way as we're a veteran family too. Uh, he's from a multi-ethnic family as his uh, spouse is, a, is Latina and also previously comes from a university that had a really robust and diverse population. And so my first thing is to have this type of conversation with President Bailey. We'll have three kind of topics of conversation and then he'll open it up to even more topics that he would like to discuss with us. But how how some of these factors uh prepared you or uh, made you inspired to do DEI work within our community and at SOU? Well, first of all, thank you, Precious, and thank you, everyone. I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, I, I'm going to ask all of you to please 
call me Rick. I, I work for Precious, so I, I'm going to keep trying to ask her to call me Rick. Um, and uh, yeah, it, very interesting. And, and if 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 you'll indulge me, I'd like to I'd like to start, if, if I may, um, with a with some gratitude and and an apology. Um, and and because it was a catalyst for for me coming to to this forum. And if if it's okay, Precious, can I share that story? Yes, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So we um, there last summer, there were um, there were questions, and there were certain groups um, who made the decision not to participate in the in the Ashland July Fourth parade, and and I remember it coming to us and the chamber coming to us and hey you know Rick what is the SOE going to do and 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 so we were in a kind of an interesting spot right how do we how do we how do we honor the the, the entities who have decided not to do this and and yet you know help the chamber because this is a you know a traditional thing in Ashland and um and so I put out a statement that we the university put out a statement that said, hey, here's here's our perspective that you know we 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 recognize what well, we very much respect those who who are choosing not to participate. Uh, the university university position is that we we recognize that July Fourth was not the the end of work, right? It wasn't, an, um, it, it was the beginning of some other things. Um, we were the first, you know, obviously we, we held the big Juneteenth celebration on the campus. And, um, and so there's a lot of, there's a lot, we, th there's some complexities. Um, and, and unfortunately, and this is really my fault, um, cause I have to take responsibility for what we do as a university. I think it oversimplified the decision that others made not to participate in the, in the event. And um, and so it, obviously you know we we weren't intending to 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 do that, but it doesn't matter what we intend. What matters is how people um, received it. And so um, my there's here's where my gratitude comes in. So Precious um, was the first one to say, "Hey Rick, you know here's how some people are receiving this." And and in reality, the decision about this parade is really complicated, right? And so there are a multitude of different um, factors that are weighing in from different people in different groups about um, that parade. And it was a real eye opener for me. And so I'm grateful to Precious for her leadership and her advocacy. I'm grateful because I, it was through that conversation that uh, that we were able to create this pathway for me to be with you. So um, so I'm sorry for that long intro, but um, I wanted to I wanted to share that. Um, in terms of in terms of our EDI work, I think there's I think three things. Um, I think SOU has done a really good job for a long time about espousing the principles of inclusivity and justice and equity and diversity. And, and we, we, we have done that for a long time. But our, our, the ways in which you can measure that um, probably have not evolved as, as quickly as we want. And so uh, I, I applaud my predecessor, Linda Schott, who under her tenure said, let's have a vice president whose who's focus, whose singular focus is this work for the institution. And, and I know uh, you've had a chance to meet her, but um, we, we have been given a gift in Toya Cooper and, and the work that she's doing with us. Um, and so, so I really applaud that. And obviously I'm a huge fan of Toya's and the, and the great work that she's doing. Um, Toya and I are are in lockstep with each other. Um, we 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 share an office, and um, I think both of us recognize that we can do all these great things at the university, but it because of who we serve, it doesn't matter if it's not if it's not replicated outside the campus, right? And 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 in the greater region, because um, you know. Uh, one, because ethically that's important, and two, because uh, it's it's it makes sense that not everyone is on our campus twenty four seven. So we have to make this part of a larger strategy, and I think Toya is is uh, is really well placed to do that. And last thing I'll say on this is that um, it is not Toya's job alone to do this work. It's every student, every faculty member, every staff member, every administrator. 
um, all of our donors, our alumni, our foundation, our business leaders, community partners, everybody has to has to be a part of this of this work. Toya is our guide, but all of us are stakeholders in it. And, and so the our goal is to really make it a universal concept um, as we move forward. Um, Precious is right. I, I came from Northern New Mexico College. I was the president there for five and a half years. Um, and, and it was very interesting because at Northern New Mexico College, 91% of their students self-identify as students of color, 91%. And so um, the, 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 the move is very different. Um, the, the, the work is very, EDI work is very different there than it is here. There, it was really about how do we really create an environment um, where um, everyone is valued and everyone is, you know, we, we're, we're creating that, that environment. At SOU, we, it's not that diverse. And so at SOU, it's that plus more, because now it's also about how do we create that environment and, and celebrate that to a larger audience so that more and more people from minoritized backgrounds and people who are who are underrepresented in higher education not only feel welcome at at SOU but know that they belong here um and so i think and and so that's a that's an added um initiative really in terms of what we're doing so I'll, i i i can go on forever so i'll i'll stop there precious thank you thank you yeah yes you answered uh my second question which was about toya cooper so i'll move on to the last question before <laughs> okay. we go into discussion and uh, have you ask questions or uh, have topics of discussion that you would like to have. Uh, the last one is, so I feel like you, you've you only been here for 11 months, but it feels longer for some reason. I think you got a big introduction into our city as you know our campus has opened up and our city has opened up from the pandemic a bit. I hope that you got to experience Halloween here because it's wild. Um, you experienced the 4th of July and Indigenous Peoples Day and uh, unfortunately, you know, fire season as well. But with all these different things that you've experienced and getting to know our community demographics, what kind of opportunities do you see for SOU to grow, Ashland to grow, and for us to be able to work with you and work together? So that's a great question. And this is something I told Councillor Duquesne, um, I think the last time we spoke, I think it was at, at Pride at the Pride Day event, um, that I think SOU has this opportunity in the sense that it, there's so many people since I've moved here call SOU a hidden gem, which is great, right? There, there's something really beautiful about our school. Um, but then there's also the, well, why is it hidden? Um, you know, why why are we not shining this thing up and and letting the world know? Now, I know that the city of Ashland, I'm going to look to my friend Joe Lassard about this, but I, I know the city of Ashland would not be super happy if SOU all of a sudden overnight now has 25,000 students who live here. Like that might, we, we might have a challenge with that. Um, but I do think there's an opportunity for us to grow. And, and part of that is change is always turbulent. And so one of the things, and I, I applaud our faculty and our staff um, because we're all united on this, as challenging as it is, we wanna change the fiscal model of the institution so that we don't continue to put more and more on the backs of our students in terms of tuition. And, and I am confident that as we make these changes and some of the, some of the ideas that we're, you know, like the, we're talking about a senior living facility on our campus, we're talking about a university business district, um, all of those things to help change the fiscal model. I think SOU very quickly is going to start to get a reputation for being a leader in how we change that fiscal model. And I think that will bring a lot more with it. We're, we, we're already breaking our fundraising efforts far more than I would have even imagined when I got here. Um, I think that's going to continue. Um, and so I, I think our, I think, not just think, I know that SOU's best days are ahead of us, not behind us. And, I, and that's a bold statement, knowing that we've we've had 150 really good years, um, but I'm confident that our best days are ahead of us. Thank you. Let's open it up to conversation from our commission, from uh, President Bailey and anyone attending. There's a comment. comment. Oh, you can go ahead. Go Emily. ahead, Tammy. I just wanted to um, ask the president, once again, thank you for being here. I really appreciate you coming and taking your time out to talk to us. So um, before I stated that um, I am an employee at Ashton Middle School, 
And um, one thing that I've noticed that we have been running, not even running into something that's been happening even before I was there is that there is a, a lack of cultural sensitivity amongst not only the administration, but amongst the students and their parents. So I know that you said that, especially since SOU is not really as diverse, what are some of the, I guess, I don't know, I guess trainings or what are some of the things that you, you run into, especially since a lot of your students are, a lot of your students are predominantly white. Um, what are some of the things that you do for like your students of color to make them feel safe? Yeah, it's a great. It's a great question, Tammy. So uh, let me, I, I have a. I have several different answers. I'll, I'll give you a, a couple. Um, one is, and I have to give credit to Toya for this. But um, my second day on the job um, in January, we started um, thirty. I think there were thirty six of us. Um, basically, every administrative leader at the at the university all came together and took a um, a class. Um, a uh, several month class from the USC Equity Institute mm -hmm. and really to learn, I mean, so that we could learn, right? Um, and to learn things. And by the way, there were so many things in that course, even coming from a place like Northern New Mexico College, where I felt like, hey, I, I think I, I understand this. And there were still things that, that were, um, that I really still had to learn. Um, things like microaggressions. And, and you know, there, there's all these, there's these things that if you're not really, tuned to, um, you can become, you can be part of the problem. Um, and so, so I give Toya credit for that to help educate us. And I do think that in that sense, we, and so now the question is, how do we, how do we, um, make sure that, that the entire institution learns the way we did, um, in terms of students who, um, who come from groups who are underrepresented in higher ed, um, the, we, we have the, the, um, the SJEC, the Social Justice and Equity Center. And at, that is a, a, a really, really wonderful resource for our students. And, and so there are um, affinity groups where, um, and by the way, this isn't just inside the, the institution. For example, we have, um, we have a very large student population from American Samoa. And so there are groups from the community um, who who help engage with our students, and by the way, who are from who are from there. So they they have a nickname. They call them the TS, the 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 Antis. Um, and um, and so it, and so there there there's a there's a community built in, and a resource and support network. Um, and so with a lot of separate group, with a lot of different groups, there are those opportunities. Um, and the SJEC is also intentionally um, built so that it's not always divided, right? Where, where, where those groups can, um, can come together. Um, if, uh, recently, sorry for the long answer, Tammy. Um, recently, within the last couple of weeks, um, as part of our new student orientation, because we started the, the, the fall term mid third, third week of September, um, that first week of, of classes, um, we had a free lunch every day in the SJEC celebrating um, groups of people. Um, and so it, the, the thing that gave me hope, and this is to your point about the, how the fact that, you know, we are not diverse, we're more diverse than the region. So we're, we're proud of that, but we know we have room to grow, right. um, is that it wasn't just people from that group. So for example, one of them was um, um, celebrating our LGBTQ plus community, but it wasn't just members of that community who were, there were others who were, there were allies as part of that, a uh, part of that group. So I think the more we do that kind of work, um, the better. Last thing I'll say is we, we, as a university, we don't always, ah, okay. we don't always, um, uh, meet the standards we set for ourselves. Um, and so the the question is, how do we respond when those things happen? Um, and I know in the past, one of the challenges that we had from the students, and the students told me this, was that, you know, there would be some, like a poster or something offensive that, you know, someone puts up, and the university doesn't say anything about it until three days later. Well, now there's a tacit, even though it's not intentional, there's a tacit, um, you know, approval, or at least a um, not a willingness to confront it head on. And so I think we've been very intentional about 
um, about being very, very responsive um, to those things. Now, luckily, we have not had a lot of that um, to do. But uh, Emily, the you know Emily talked about um, the the threats on Nataki. Well, SOU put out a statement in support of hockey and in support of OSF that that isn't just about denouncing threats of violence, but also, hey, look at what Nataki's doing. Let's celebrate that she is championing a diversity of in in the arts, right? And giving arts. So there's we're we're, we're trying to to step beyond um, in terms of our advocacy and our representation. Thank so. you. I appreciate that. I appreciate your um and no please don't apologize for that answer because that's really because I'm going and I'm going through so much at my middle school right now with just with stuff on campus, like we had crazy hair day the past few, like a few days ago. And like, we had a whole bunch of the white kids showing up with afros oh. and like braids, like mimicking black hairstyles. And then we, um, we brought the attention to our principal and, you know, he apologized and it wasn't even really his place to apologize. It's more so like the parents, like yeah. you should, you know, you know, the parents have to be more proactive, but, you know, I really appreciate the, the work that you're doing and that you're trying to do because as the person who's actually who's a person that's working inside the school it's still her it's still happening it's even happening with our younger kids so i appreciate you thank you thank you for answering my question Tammy, may i ask a favor um because i think there are things that you're experiencing at the middle school that i think we can learn lessons from what you're doing and the work you're doing um, yeah i'm actually working with um, um a lady on the school board and i think her name is jill I can't Jill remember her last name. Yes, Jill Franco. Franco sorry. Yes, Jill Franco um, for the school board. I'm, I'm supposed to be meeting with her in another week and a half just for like suggestions that she has. Cause, but I can definitely send you um, after the meeting's over and stuff. I could definitely like shoot you an email and we can like um, piggyback off each other for ideas and things. And if you want to use some of the examples that are happening in at, specifically at the middle school, I'll I'll be glad to send them over to you. I would I would I would love that, Tammy. And I'll I'll put my um I'll put my email in the chat. Perfect. Um, I'm gonna put. I'm gonna take that down right now. We put it in. Um, one, Tammy. Just so you know, too, one of the other um, people on the Ashland School Board is Sabrina Prudhomme, and mm -hmm. Sabrina works at um, the university. She is the she is the board of trustees. Yes, my fiance um, actually connected me with her. I think she. I think he tagged her in her email or CC me an email. I think she emailed me back. But yeah, I'm trying to just, you know, kind of get the conversations going because it's on, it's in the elementary school, it's in the middle school. And I can only imagine how bad it is certain situations actually at the college level. So, you know, yeah. these are definitely really big conversations that we need to have. And, you know, you know, like I'm from the educational aspect of it, it's more so you know, we, it really needs to be a teaching moment. Like, yeah, you mm -hmm. did something that was really bad, but I feel what we're losing is just like, you know, it's just like cancel culture. We're not teaching them right. what they did wrong. So I think that, right. you know, that's that's really important to do. So yes, I will definitely touch base with you in like a few days or so. Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks, Tammy. Thank you so much, Tammy. And thank you, President Bailey. Is there any other uh, topics or uh, especially... Uh, from our commission or anyone else or President Bailey? Yeah, Angela and then Emily. Oh, and I just had a um, kind of bouncing off of what Tammy said. I was wondering, and I don't know, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know how much you're involved in, in individual departments, but as a parent whose two kids went through the elementary, middle school and high school, Tammy, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I was wondered if there was an effort at the university to kind of to find and place teachers of color like within the teaching program, like finding teachers and making sure they can get into great question, schools. great question. Yeah, that 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 is Angela, and I don't have I don't have an answer for, and I I don't want to try to fumble through an answer that I'm not that I that I can't give you an uh, an honest answer. I think it's a really good initiative. So I, I as you're asking, I, I just took a note down to like, okay, that's really good. So we we do have a new division director named Vance Durrington, um, who came to us from North Carolina. Um, I'll ask that question. Um, I think Vance is the one to, but it's a great point. Thanks, Thanks Angela. Emily. That was going to be my question. So I'm going to stop talking, oddly enough for me and ask if there's uh, anybody else who wants to ask another question. Even including President Bailey, is there anything you would like to know about our commission or anything like that? Yeah, I just have one question really, and it's not, not it's an ongoing question, but 
Um, and, and Tammy, you know, started it too. And, and Angela's question is another one, but what, what are the things that you can do um, to be a partner in this work um, with you and the things that, that SERJ, that your vision for how we move forward and do this work, what are the ways in which we can do uh, to be a better partner? And um, so I would love for that to be an ongoing conversation. I'm actually going to answer that slightly, if I might. Um, I think, Rick, that you're doing a lot of those things already by your public persona in the community uh, in terms of, you know, you've got the Ashland New Plays Festival there now at, at SOU and you mentioned it. I think that because people listen to you in terms of having a public persona, that you have a unique opportunity to mention the notion of DEI, a racial equity lens, uh, that in every situation in which you talk. So yeah. it's, it's not just wonderful that the Ashland New Plays Festival was there, but the one that I happened to see you at was written by an Iranian playwright, which is a voice that is not normally heard and is a person of color. And I think it gives you the opportunity to say once again, because you can't say it enough about being a welcoming environment and how a welcoming environment means at every single level yeah. and in terms of what people are doing and celebrating that. I think that in terms of when you give a, a sports presentation or when you have people come to a to, to a football game, okay? Um, it gives you the opportunity to celebrate the students of color who are on the football team in terms of what they have to go through to maintain being in school and the recognition of that. So I think that as a person of renown in the community, you're somebody who often gets called a local celebrity, is you've got a platform that is different from a lot of other people and that you not only should use it, but that honestly you have an obligation to use it. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that, Emily. And and I I will say, you know, it, as you're as you were giving that comment, I I think about how uh, right now, look what uh, the Supreme Court did this week in hearing oral arguments about um, Harvard and the University of North Carolina's you know, um, admissions policies and, and it's under fire, you know, those are under fire, um, from the court. And, um, so you're right. We, we it's an obligation. Uh, and I, I take that obligation seriously. So I, I, I appreciate the advice and the recommendation. Okay. Thank you. It, it furthers our work because we should, yeah. as you said, everybody should be working towards this goal. So thank you. I'll quickly add, because I know we have to move on, um, that as I mentioned in uh, different uh, forums and different opportunities, that part of my personal goal on this commission is to be able to see um, people of color, LGBTQ, people of marginalized identities, uh, find Ashland as their home, but not just for three to five years, find it as their home for their children and uh, their parents and their future generations. I feel that we will be succeeding as a city once we start to see that people are actually staying here, people of color, especially for more than three years, more than five years, making this their home throughout time, having their children here, you know, growing up here and so on. So that's something that I hope to see. And I think that's a big part of the college too, of uh, we get students of color, we get people of marginalized identities here, but how do we also make it so they could thrive after they graduate from college and um, you know even outside of college just making it a place where uh, people feel that this is their home not yeah. a temporary home but their home yeah great point precious thank you so much president bailey and we will continue to keep in touch with you and i think that you attending and coming here makes it so that we do feel welcome uh, keeping in touch and staying engaged. And please uh, feel free to always connect with us, to connect with me, any of us. And um, thank you once again from our hearts. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming.
Okay. Um, hey, shameless plug, if you're not doing anything, I'm heading out from here to go. Um, we have the Oregon Writing Project. Some of our, our writing students are, are giving a presentation in the library uh, in, a, in a few minutes. So if the meeting ends early and you're close, third floor of the library. Thank you very much. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Um, moving on to our next agenda item is Chief O'Mara and Joe Lassard, which um, sort of got smushed together, even though there are additional items that the city manager needs to talk to us about uh, regarding a DEI assessment and also regarding a welcoming project. But, but as I understand it, the impetus behind, and we're very appreciative of it, of Ty and Joe coming to talk to us was regarding the situation with Nataki Garrett and to give us an update on the, uh, the Ashland Police Department and the city of Ashland's reaction to that. So what I would like to do, if this is okay with Ty and Joe, is to start with Ty um, giving us an update on the response from the city of Ashland Police Department and then uh, move on to Joe in terms of what the city of Ashland has done as a city. Um, and then we can perhaps have a discussion about that before we go to the individual items that you wanted to talk to us about, Joe, that are, that are separate. Does that sound like it makes sense? Thumbs up, great. Um, so Chief, will you, will you begin? And thank you again for coming. No problem, Emily, always good to see you and everybody else. Um, so going back to the beginning, I was made aware of the NPR article, the end this situation the same way that everybody else was. Uh, we were kind of taken by surprise by it. The following Monday, um, one of the first things I had a conversation with the mayor and then with Joe and discussed um, our initial moves. Uh, I reached out to Nataki and through Nataki David and Nataki's security team or the OSF security team, I should say, because I, I know that they do more than protect Nataki. And uh, we agreed to have a meeting. Um, we met about a week later and some, some information was shared with me. Uh, the information that was shared with me, I asked if they wanted me to try to do anything with it. And uh, they said, no, um, I, I, I respect that there are some complications on the OSF side that we need to navigate. Uh, I also respect that there are sometimes hesitations with uh, members of the black community and other marginalized communities and engaging with the police um, that, could explain their reticence to uh, pull us into this conversation when these incidents were happening. Um, that's neither here nor there. The fact is we're here and how can we go forward together in partnership? So uh, nothing was asked of the police department after that first meeting. Uh, we agreed, David, Anthony and Jeremiah, I think is, no, Zachariah. Um, we agreed to have monthly meetings going forward so that we could um, partner with each other as much as possible, or at least keep one another abreast of what's going on as much as possible, so that um, information and uh, commonalities are not siloed within each organization. Uh, that next meeting is happening in a couple of weeks. Recently, earlier this week, I talked to, um, the city manager, Joe, uh, to follow up on this. And we um, agreed that we should try to get as much information out of OSF as possible. So I made that request to OSF and um, I assume that that decision is churning on the other side of the conversation. Uh, I want to you know, put the police department in as best a position as possible to um, protect all the company members, the festival, and indeed the entire town. So I, that, that's a, a work in progress that 
Uh, that, that's all the update that I have. Um, I, I'm glad that we responded as soon as we were made aware of it. Um, and uh, I, I know that there is a um, perceived uh, chasm in the relationship between OSF and the Ashland Police Department. Uh, and whether or not I agree that that chasm uh, is merited, it doesn't matter, it's there. And uh, there's some relationship building for us to, to work on going forward, which I'm open to. Thanks, Ty. Um, Joe, do you wanna make any comments about that before we go into questions? Uh, I, I think uh, I think maybe perhaps questions on that specific incident or what we know might be best first, and then uh, maybe we get into some broader questions. Okay. Um, are there any questions about the specific incident that anybody wants to ask? Uh, understanding, and and I'm saying this genuinely that individual facts. Uh, and I mean facts in the broadest possible terms, that there are times when individual facts and processes cannot really be fully exposed at the risk of injuring an investigation or at the risk of injuring uh, the, the person who's the victim, to be honest, um, in terms of Nataki Garrett. So I, I feel pretty, as the chair of this commission, I feel pretty protective of making sure that we're not doing further injury to Nataki Garrett or to any other individual in this town or city or person who's been victimized by, by racial threats or by racial inequities. So if people want to ask individual questions before we get to sort of process questions, as Joe has suggested, uh, now would be the moment to do that. I have a question. And sure. this isn't a question specifically because thank you for saying that, Emily. I don't want to re-victimize Nataki all over again. So this is more of like a general question for um, Ty and Joe. So what's the police department's, um, what happens after someone like gets a death threat? Like what does the police department immediately, immediately do if you're allowed to share that information? Not um, like I a specific. Can, yeah. I, I can share it. Um, we can talk about it all night. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we can't talk about it all night. Uh, that's fine. Um, so I'll, I'll try to channel Emily, the lawyer, because lawyers always say it depends. It depends on what the situation is, and it depends on what the victim's wants are on that. As Emily said, um, and the, this has been part of the conversation on my end, uh, if somebody is in a situation um, presuming that they want path A to be taken and not taking into consideration their feelings puts them in the proverbial trick bag and it you risk bringing more trauma and drama onto them when all they wanted to do was maybe take the first step down the path. So we can't assume that the person that's being victimized wants anything to be done. Uh, if they do want something to be done, it depends on what the circumstances are. The, the fact is, and I'm, I don't even have Nataki or OSF situation on, on my mind when I give this example, but the fact is, if, if somebody calls me up on the phone and says, Ty, I'm going to kill you the next time I see you, um, th that frankly is not against the law. It's, it's not a violation of Oregon law. If, if somebody approaches me on the street and says, Ty, I'm going to go get my baseball bat that I keep behind, keep behind my bed and I'm going to return. And when I get back, I'm going to smash your head in. Now, I'm not trying to be gross. I'm just trying to demonstrate something here. That is not against the law. The person has to have the immediate ability, intent and opportunity to do me harm um, for, for it to count as the crime of menacing. So it depends. Um, it depends on, is it a local threat that maybe we can take action on, or is it something that's coming from far away? Um, I want the police department to be as responsive as possible. I want us to be as approachable as possible. Um, until I know what the specifics are of a threat 
uh, or the investigating officer does, I simply can't predict what the outcome is going to be because it depends on where we start, um, what the potential endpoint is, and everything in between, including what the victim wants to do with the situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for answering the question. I appreciate no it. No problem. Anybody else? Okay, so I'm without debating the legalities too much. Um, I'm just going to ask Ty this question. Ty, if there is a circumstance when somebody says, and you said you weren't being gross, and I'm not trying to be inflammatory in saying this, but if somebody says, I've got a baseball bat behind me, and I'm going to take this baseball bat out, and I'm going to kill you, okay, because of the color of your skin, uh, or because of your perceived gender orientation, or your perceived religion, or your perceived gender. Right, um, that's a different situation, for sure. Okay, and when you say it's a different situation, what is the reaction of the Ashland Police Department in that kind of different situation? Thank you, Emily. Um, I, I was speaking on death threats in general before, um, because a lot of people want to assume that threatening somebody is automatically illegal, and it's not. But right. if, you, if you do bring a bias crime or a threat to visit force upon somebody because of their protected status, that's an autom that is an automatic crime. And I very much want to know about that. And I very much want the National Police Department to prosecute that to the fullest extent of the law. And I know that there have been, uh, that there has been, um, we're all aware of the Aiden Ellison incident from almost a year, two years ago now. And I, um, I'm aware that there is um, uh, that there is frustration that that couldn't be charged as a bias crime, uh, and I agree that there's great speculation about whether or not if Aiden had been a young white man, it would have ended up the same way. I think that that's a really robust um, exploration that that we need, and that um, uh, that that furthers this body of work, but the fact is we couldn't get to the point of charging a bias crime. But as a demonstration that we do take that seriously, when the young black man was assaulted out at the gas station uh, by exit 14, there was clear evidence that that was done because he was black. And we very eagerly pursued that as a bias crime and the prosecutor pursued it as a bias crime. So we do have evidence that the Ashland Police Department, when we are presented with the um, the, the facts, when we're armed with that evidence, we will do everything we can to hold people accountable for committing bias crimes in our community. Anybody else have any questions for Chief O'Meara at this point before we now go to Joe um, in terms of sort of the general overview before I come back probably with some additional questions? Uh, anybody? Not seeing anybody, Joe, go for it. Good evening. Um, I'm not sure that I can add a whole lot more than what uh, Chief Amir has added. I think uh, the conversations that he and I have had are uh, focused on really kind of two questions. Uh, the safety of uh, Ms. Garrett uh, and her ability to live and enjoy the, uh, the benefits of being in Ashland, Oregon, like everyone else. Um, uh, at, but there's also the question of the general public safety. So we have two concerns here. Uh, if this is happening to one of the members of our community, we want to know about it. And we also want to know if it has a broader implications for our community in terms of the public safety. So we continue to have some dialogue. We need to learn more about what the particular threats are so we understand what they mean. And also we want to be sure that as uh, Ms. Garrett moves around the community, if she is uh, with a security uh, uh, individual with her, that we also understand what that means uh, and that there aren't inadvertent experiences where people don't expect or, uh, uh, you know, encountering her in the street, that there's someone with her that we want to be sure that that uh, that she is safe in the, as she moves around the community, but also that the community, that we understand the public safety aspects, that she also has someone with her for security purposes and what that may mean. People may misconstrue having someone with her all the time. Uh, and uh, we want to be sure that our, our police force is aware of those circumstances 
and so we don't have unintended uh, encounters by people in the in the community wondering what's going on. So those that's a general public safety question that that we, we need to continue to to um, engage on. Um, the council has and through the mayor has spoken about this issue. Uh, I think uh, her statement, as well as the the comments from other council members, particularly. Uh, Councilmember Duquesne are uh, are relevant to the, the city's stance on these issues. So we uh, want to continue to be vigilant. We want to understand what's going on, and we will continue to work with uh, OSF to try to understand their needs uh, as well, because they are an important institution in our community. So uh, really, that's sort of the uh, the level of of care that we're trying to uh, provide in this case. Thanks. Before I ask some questions, or is there a question from anybody else, question or comment from anybody else uh, on the committee? I have, I have a question. Go ahead, Tammy. I do. I'm sorry, Tammy again. Um, so when you talk about, um, with the, just for example, I'm just gonna talk about Nataki because that's what we refer referencing. So when you talk about public safety, is her being with some, are, are you saying that um, her being with someone out in the public that maybe like a security detail would make the public is making the public feel is making the public feel a type of way or I, I was just trying to understand what you mean about public safety in reference to Nataki if you could just explain that one more time for me well there have been instances in in the, in the past around the country where people have misconstrued what having a security uh, person with you means and so we want to be sure that she's safe, but also her security person is safe as well as the community understands it so it's important that the police department understands the level of security that she's getting. And if there are any questions in the community, we're able to uh, respond to them. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Anybody else? Julie has Oh, hand Julie, up. thank you. I see it now. Thank you, Julie. Oh, sure. Uh, um, I've noticed over the years um, that when these uh, situations arise are often called incidents or there was an incident that occurred or incidents like this. And um, I, I would like to know overall, and I know Serge is, is part of the change um, that's hoped for, but how the city um, and all of us within it shift from looking at individual incidents as, in, as individual incidents as and part of a, um, a deeper and broader pattern and system that we all need to participate in more. Um, I just, I'm not a, a bureaucrat or a politician and sometimes the language uh, uh, trips me up a little bit that I think if we're gonna call out what we see as, as real core problems versus within, within, a, within a system versus um, singular situations that just sort of happen to occur. Um, mm -hmm. They don't happen in a vacuum. And that's what I'm concerned about, both for Nataki, who you know, is doing, I think, great work uh, in and for our community, but also ev everyone walking down the street, Tammy and, and the kids, this middle school that we just heard this very, it's a very, seems like a really little thing, right? But it's not a little thing at all. It's a huge thing. It's a deeply emotional thing that many people in our community are bearing the burden of all the time, which these are not incidents to them. It is a system and it is a deep pattern. So uh, and that's maybe not even a question. It's uh, just, I really hope this is uh, the moment where we start looking at these things as systemic patterned, uh, in woven so that we can do some unweaving and, and reweaving of a better uh, city for all of us. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. I am going to uh, ask both Ty and Joe if they have responses to that question or that comment. I, Julie, I hear you. I think it's a great point. I had not thought about that before and how um, simple word choice uh, can frame it in one way or another. So thank you for making it. And I will do my best to keep that in mind going forward. Um, I guess my comment is, I think as a society, we're becoming traumatized. I think that we have learned to live with trauma 
in ways that we've never had to live with it before. It, uh, and trauma, when you have uh, trauma in, uh, organized individuals in your society and their society is becoming that way, we have a lack of trust and safety. We have uh, uh, distrust in authority. Uh, I think people are, we tend to have uh, more uh, outbursts, uh, lack of emotional control. We have difficulty problem solving as a community or as a society. Um, we have a confused sense of what's fair play is, um, and we have communication problems. And I think, um, I, I don't think it's just Ashland. I think it's the, I think you see this kind of issue around the country. Uh, events that used to be uh, highly unusual, uh, outbursts of violence, gun violence and so forth have now become way too commonplace in our society. And, um, and I think what happens is all those items I listed, uh, one of the responses you quite often get is people resort to violence quicker. And, um, and I, I'm not sure I know the answer, but I, I see the symptoms. And I think, uh, I think we have to, we, as, a, as a city, um, as, a, as a community or, or a country, we have to figure out how to deal with all that. I certainly would concur with you that over the past eight years, um, and certainly in the last two, we are increasingly agitated due to so much stress and pressure from COVID from many things, but systemic racism and white supremacy is extremely old. Mm -hmm. So that's not new. Yeah. People that are dealing with that burden have been dealing with that burden for hundreds of years in familial ways. They have <laughs> survived uh, in ways I can't even, I, I don't have the lived experience of that survival. And now we're dealing with increased agitation. So the baseline was already there <laughs> pre 10 years ago, pre 15 years ago, and there's more agitation on top of it. So those are two things. They're connected, but they're not the same thing. And I, um, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I just don't want to move away without naming that racism and white supremacy and the harm that is in exemplified and what's gone on with actors at OSF and 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 with Nataki is not new historically. I think also Julie to piggyback off what you're saying I think also the issue is we're just really so desensitized because literally everything is on TikTok everything is on Instagram, literally things that you don't want to see, they're in your face. And I think that's a really big issue with what's going on and what the, the police department, what the, what the committees, what every single person across the United States is dealing with. We are just so desensitized to the things that are going on that it just, it doesn't, when you're seeing somebody getting gunned down in the street or you see people just take their phones out and they start recording it because people don't see other people as human anymore. And, you know, that's also just, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to piggyback off that with Julie for what she was saying, because I 100% agree with what she was saying. I, I guess I would add one thing that I, I want to go back and mention. I mentioned this confused sense of fair play that we seem to be having. And I think what's happening is dominant culture parts of our, our society are deciding that they are not being treated fair. Uh, and so they are acting out in ways that are improper. And they think they're the ones who are victimized and really don't have a perspective uh, about what uh, what uh, life has been for uh, parts yes. of our society. So that's I, the confused, I hear that. that's the confused fair play question that's happening in that society. Too. And I think it tends to lead those individuals to violence as a result, a first resort instead of a second resort. Yeah, I hear that, Joe. Thank you for clarifying, and um, I really I deeply appreciate your framing on that. Uh, Whoops. Okay. All right. Um, I appreciate those questions and answers. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Tammy. Um, I do have a couple of more questions that I'd like to ask both Ty and Joe. Um, and it starts with uh, and I don't know if you got the email. I sent you, you guys an email about this. Racial equity lens. Okay. The phrase racial equity lens. Have you heard the term? 
Yes, yes, I'm familiar with it as, uh, but the, the way I'm uh, familiar with it is uh, uh, a racial equity and empowerment lens. Okay. And what do you mean by a racial equity empowerment lens? Joe, well, what, does, what do those words mean to you? Well, uh, it's a, a lens or the lens is a, a tool to help organizations uh, take action to rectify social, racial inequities. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a series of questions or processes that you put in place uh, uh, to empower uh, uh, your organization to assess uh, the impact of, uh, of uh, dominant culture institutional practices. Okay, um, thank you. Ty, do you have the same sort of answer or do you have a di different sense of what it means? Um, I, I would describe it as being sensitive to uh, the recognition that uh, different people view the same situation through different lenses based off of their, uh, their own history and cultural histories and whatnot. And so what I might see as uh, a white male um, having lived Ty O'Mara's life uh, might not be something that a person of color sees if we're looking at the exact same situation we might see two completely di different things and have two completely different opinions about it uh, so that we need to be respectful that um, each person's angle of perspective on something is not the only angle that exists thanks trauma-informed systems heard the terms yes i'm i'm familiar with it it's uh Trauma-informed systems is um, uh, an approach to the offering or the provision of services for, by institutions generally to individuals or groups. It comes out of the research about trauma organized individuals. Uh, the items that I talked about earlier about the sense of fair play and communications and cognitive problems, those are all uh, attributes of trauma organized individuals. And uh, there's a, a, a burgeoning understanding that uh, institutions who provide services need to have an understanding that the, the people that they are serving may be trauma organized individuals and you don't want to be in you want to be sure that your your service delivery or the care that you're giving doesn't re-traumatize or victimize those individuals and so that's uh, that's that uh, that institutional system approach that needs to be put in place and it's uh it's still kind of a burgeoning area because there are different definitions of how to measure or address uh, individuals in, in those institutional or that service delivery approach. But it's, uh, it's certainly a, uh, uh, a growing area of, of uh, uh, I guess, concern or, or understanding. Uh, my familiarity is from its, uh, uh, the, the use of that approach for uh, homeless individuals. Quite often, it's just the fact of living rough uh, for a period of time can give uh, individuals PTSD. And so quite often when you work with them, you find that they have difficulties with uh, problems with authority. They can't, um, they can't integrate uh, well uh, their emotional behavior. Uh, they, can't, um, they can't be confined. They have, they have a number of difficulties that just comes up because they've been living rough or they've had childhood or adolescent um, uh, events that, um, uh, that uh, uh, put them at risk, the uh, difficulties of coping. Uh, um, also individuals who, um, who uh, older individuals, it's usually war or violence uh, that uh, cause problems. So whenever you have this abuse or this adversity or this exposure to trauma, you end up with the potential for this, this type of trauma organized individual behavior and your institutions have to be sensitive enough and well versed enough in the potential for that, that they know how to, how to work with those individuals. Ty, have anything else to add to that? The only, the only thing that I'd add is that for years and years and years, the Ashland Police Department has been using uh, trauma-informed interviewing, especially with sex assault survivors. Um, and doing it in a manner that does not re-victimize, that empowers the, the sex assault survivor. And so it's something that um, 
Ashland police officers get exposed to uh, very quickly when they come on board. And I think that they even get exposed to it at the academy now. Okay, so the reason I'm asking these two questions for people both on the committee and for Joe and Ty's sake is because um, taking the statement, which I genuinely believe at face value of wanting to make sure that there is a bridge built between the Ashland Police Department and OSF because this is, and I certainly don't work for OSF when I'm saying these things, uh, because this is not the first time that this has happened with uh, OSF employees, contractors, actors, people of color who come to this town to work and who wind up needing a, a separate security force by OSF to feel safe in terms of getting driven home. So I appreciate Ty about wanting to have meetings with OSF, but my question, and I think this goes back to the, the bigger systemic question that, that Julie was asking is what can or what should be in a broader community sense, in a broader sense that involves everybody in Ashland because we're all connected to OSF, either economically or culturally or any other way or as a tax basis is uh, based on what President Bailey was saying today when he said it's up to all of us is understanding about racial equity lens and conscious leadership, which is another issue, trauma-informed systems is, do you have any thoughts as, again, leaders of the community who have a status of local celebrity for both of you of what can be done to make sure that within Ashland, that both the members of the Ashland Police Department and all of us continue to address this issue after this quote unquote incident is gone before we get to the next one. So what's the proactive forward taking steps that you guys can take and that we on Surjack will take because we are certainly have a platform as well. That's my question. I, I Emily, I, I don't have an answer and I don't know that anybody has an answer, but one part of the answer is that, and I'm not, I'm not alluding to you having said this, that this is not, um, I wanna say that again, I'm not saying you said this, but this is not an APD OSF issue. That this is a you know community-wide, county-wide, statewide, national issue that we can try to make some work on uh, or we can try to make some progress on locally in a meaningful way. Um, the Ashland Police Department is willing to be a part of that work. And uh, I think that I've demonstrated that when given the opportunity to demonstrate it. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I'd love to be a part of that conversation to see how we can affect change locally. Um, you know, full recognition that there obviously is racism here today in Ashland, even though we like to think that we live in, you know, a bubble. We, Ashland has a racist as heck history. Oregon has a very racist history. And some of that stuff is still lingering clearly. Um, so I, for one, am happy to be a part of that conversation as long as it's recognized that it's not a a line between APD and OSF, that it is much more encompassing than that. And it's a community-wide conversation. You know, um, Tammy, to your point about what's going on in the schools and um, what's going on, uh, on at SOU. And for that matter, what happens in, in the medical field? What happens in human resources? What happens in the finance world? This systemic problem is so big. One of the things I, I'm, I'm just, preaching, I guess, for a second. One of the things that frustrates me so much is that people want to say that the, the problem that we've been facing for the last 2, 10, 15 years is a problem of um, marginalized people, uh, specifically black and brown people, and how they interact with the police department. But the police department is one slice of the pie of America. And there are all the other slices that interact with people of color in a negative, traumatic way that don't come through as loud and clear and as on TikTok, as somebody said, 
the way that the police uh, interactions do. But there's this whole, this whole knot. And it, it, somebody said this stuff has to be unwoven. I agree. And I'll do my part of unweaving it, uh, it in recognition that we, we're one thread. And there's, there's a whole knot of threads that needs to be unwoven. Thank you, Ty. Joe? Um, I guess uh, I would have, I'd say two things. One, um, to me, one of the things that's interesting about Ashland is how siloed we are institutionally. I don't see, you know, I guess when I first came here to interview for this position, uh, it's hard to believe that that was uh, almost a, a year ago. Um, uh, one of the things I really found interesting is how the university doesn't seem to influence the general culture of the city. That it's not, it feels like it's sort of a separate part of the city and it doesn't, it doesn't connect more broadly. I, I sort of expected that, that um, we have a much more uh, college age uh, population influence here. We'd have that kind of college vibe going on, you know, we, We'd sort of see that that at that level of energy and involvement from the university. Um, uh, I, you know, I just sort of expected to see more demonstration of of of, uh, of uh, community integration of all the different parts of the, or at least the institutional aspects. That's what I'm used to seeing in a college town and. And uh, or a, a, or a, a city, a capital city, you know that the, you you see these cultural attributes or social attributes more broadly demonstrated in the community. And so one of the things that I found interesting is the city. I don't. It feels to me like as an institution with issues to work on, didn't seem to in, interact with the university uh, to solve problems or with the school district to solve problems. That we just sort of said, okay, this is our picture. We'll take care of this as best we can on our own. And I think the reality is the world's a lot more complicated than that. And we all know that uh, resources are a lot stretched a lot thinner than our ability to what for one institution to solve issues. So I, I think that I guess what I'm trying to say is I think we have to start breaking down those 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 things institutionally as a city or a school university or a school district. So we cooperate or collaborate in addressing issues. So I think that's one of the things from an institutional standpoint, since that's sort of the seat that I'm sitting in, uh, I think that's really important. And the voters, uh, and the second thing I'll say is not only was it, uh, do, do I see it as important, but I noticed that in the city charter under the city manager form of government, there's a clause that says that one of my duties is to promote cooperation among the city council, the staff and citizens and developing, I'm reading this now, uh, in developing city policies and building a sense of community. And now that I've said that, I can see Jean is going to take notes so she can evaluate me on that. But uh, <laughs> I think I think that's sort of the broad picture is when we are siloed, we're not building community. We're building, uh, we're not building bridges between each other. And so uh, I think that our task or our role is to, focus on that outcome. And um, I, I, I want to point out that the city council recently adopted a, a vision statement and value statement for the city that talks about respect, resiliency, uh, collaboration, and so forth. And I, I take that seriously. And as you go around the city now, the city offices, and then the employees work around their way around the city uh, offices and whatever, you'll now see that Post, we have boards posted in the lunchrooms and in the entrance places for this, the community. Uh, there's a copy of it in the city council chamber as I went there and put it up myself this week. Um, so uh, I think part of building community is, is we all have to get aligned with what's the future of our community, not the past, what's the future, and what kind of future do we want to build together? And uh, I, think, uh, I think hopefully from me and for, from the city staff, You'll hear consistently, I believe, our, my, my intention to speak consistently about we want to achieve that vision, and it, it's really about building community. Thank you, Joe. Um, thank you, Ty. Does anybody, I realize that the 
our meeting is that I'm not following the timelines and for that I apologize. Um, but I think that these were very important issues to discuss and to hear from our city leaders directly, members of the committee, uh, sort of what they're thinking about this. Um, because I think that to be really blunt and honest is that if, Joe, you're talking about a welcoming project and having us work on a welcoming project, okay? Uh, I think we have no idea what that is. Can I, I just I mean, mention something before we go to the welcoming project real quick? Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say that I, that was it, was that I don't think we know what it is. And I think that what both Ty and Joe were saying uh, brings us to what do we want this committee, this community to be and how can we get it to that place without some kind of direct action or doing something because clearly guys, clearly everybody, I don't mean guys, but clearly everybody, what we're doing right now is not working so well. So we need to do something different and that's why we're on this committee and that's why we're doing things. So I'm gonna let you go Precious in just one second as soon as I thank very much um, Chief O'Meara and Joe for being here and hope that there can be continued collaborative conversations for what the Ashton Police Department can do to have everybody feeling safe in this town because right now everybody doesn't. So thank you very much, Ty. Thanks to all of you, appreciate the engagement. I hope everybody has a great night. Thank you. Thank Ty. you for coming. Yep, bye. Thank you. I just wanted to mention really quick before Joe goes, because he had mentioned this and I want to keep it on the radar that um, two areas that um, might be challenging to have that feeling of like a campus presence within the community is one that SOU doesn't have a Greek system. So we don't have that type of um, presence that maybe some of the other colleges or university towns have that create that type of college feel through different types of uh, a Greek system. The other thing is that our demographics of students, they are coming from a very, very uh, first, first generation uh, families of college, uh, first generation college families. And second of all, they are coming from a lot of them, uh, rural areas and low income. So working like two jobs or like just not having the money to go off campus. So in terms of our future of having that type of campus uh, communication and community, I think that's something really important that we have to think about. And I think OSF is kind of responding in that way of like, how can we get, you know, college students to actually come to OSF, you know, and not feel like they're like uh, having to like go so deep in their pockets. So hopefully that will be something that our city can work with SOU of being able to get students off of campus because a lot of our students right now can't even afford to like eat out or do those type of fun things that we might see at like UCLA or uh, University of Arizona, those type of campuses. So just keeping that in mind. Thank you. Okay. Um, Joe, unfortunately, because it was an important conversation we were having at 622 and the meeting ends at 6.30. And I know that you need to and want to talk to us about both the uh, DEI assessment for the, uh, for the city of Ashland and the welcoming committee. And I think, I know you wanna to talk to us about that, but I have a question. So my understanding is, is that the amount of money that has been actually at this moment budgeted for DEI work is the $40,000 for the assessment, is that correct? That's correct. The uh, okay. assessment, the assessment or DEI programs, pretty much always start with some type of organizational assessment, and so okay. that's, that's what we budget for. But I also, I, w I just want to say that I, I consider the twenty thousand dollars that is also appropriated by the city council uh, out of our transit occupancy tax as as part of that, and that's the welcoming item. So I, I want to talk about both those when you're ready. Okay, and then my other question about that, Joe, is because this is November the 3rd, 
Um, there was a rumor that the money for the DEI assessment needed to be spent by December 31st. Is that correct? No, no. The, the, what, what, we, what we need to do is we need to issue the RFQ to, so we can award a contract to do the assessment by the end of the year. In order for the, it's budgeted to be spent in this fiscal year. So I'm trying to get the process started so that we can get and expend those funds this year and get the plan so that it, it, when we go into the next year, we will be able to appropriate the funds to implement the plan. So it's a, the, the deadline isn't to spend the money, it's to get the authors, the, the, the contractor basically, to get a contractor on board to do that work for us. The school district has done this. I, you know, the university is working through their process, but we're trying to do the same thing. Okay. Is it the same thing for the $20,000 for the welcoming project? Or is, is there a time limit on that money as well? Because I'm concerned about December 31st and the availability and, uh, and I guess capacity of this committee to assist in these things. And that's why I'm asking you, Joe. Okay, uh, that's a great question. Uh, you're, you've, got, you've got a lot of good topics tonight. Um, the, um, the, uh, it, it, it sort of depends. Uh, you know, I, it, to, to, use, takes to take Ty's uh, answer earlier, it sort of depends on the circumstances. Generally, when we implement something out of the uh, transit occupancy tax, we award a grant to someone to actually, a nonprofit or an entity to actually implement something for us. So the thought here is uh, that, and, and if you authorize the grant, uh, usually the grant is good for a period of time. And it, it could, I believe it could extend beyond the fiscal year. I think you get like 12 or 18 months potentially to implement a grant uh, award. So the, it, it, I don't think it's driven by the, uh, as much by the end of the year, December 31st date. It's more of a case of what I wanted to do is I want to talk about what that program might be so we can start to think about, okay, if we're going to get an entity on board to help us implement that pro something, we can write a scope of work for it. And then we can go out and see if we can get uh, someone to actually do it for us. Now, if that doesn't work, there's, I think there's also the potential for us to go to the city council and say, well, this is something maybe we're gonna do in house. But uh, right now, the general process that we use is awarding of, of grants. Okay, so Joe, keeping in mind, excuse me, keeping in mind that we have uh, very few minutes left tonight and potentially continuing on December the 4th, which would be 26 days before December 31st. What do you really need from us at this point? And what would you like to convey to us to do so that we can determine how we can assist you in the DEI assessment? Because it seems to me from what you've said, that that should be the first order of business. Uh, I think you're correct. I, here's what, uh, by the 1st of December, uh, we're we need to be issuing the RFP so we can get responses back by the end of the year. So probably about the middle of, of November or so, we're going to be actually drafting and finalizing the RFP so we can get it out and get it solicit and solicit that contractor. So what I'm looking for, and I believe, I believe, uh, 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 and sent out a copy of the general scope of work. What I'd like really is for you to either email back to Anne your comments or suggestions or, or edits uh, on that. And then we will take those and assemble a final uh, RFQ and issue it so we can get it done. Uh, and, and generally speaking, uh, the middle of November is uh, uh, we're kind of coming up on the middle of November, aren't we? But uh, yeah. here pretty quick, in the next couple of weeks, we really need to have your comments uh, so that we can finish the scope of work. We will attach it to our standard uh, approach for an RFQ and we will get it out so that we can get responses and can do an award before the end of the year. Uh, so that's the first item. Uh, and Hold on one sec. That's the first item for the DEI assessment. I need to check in with my committee and see if I can get somebody on the committee who feels that they have the time and the interest and the capacity, Joe, to assist in making that happen. And since it's 6.30, I'm gonna do that right now. 
while I've got everybody on the screen, okay? Committee members, is there somebody who is willing to take this on as an action item, make sure that, that responses are given on behalf of Surjack, okay, to the city manager through Anne so that our voice is heard regarding the qualifications for the DEI uh, person uh, in terms of the scope of work, which is what I understand that Joe is asking. Am I right, Joe? That's correct. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm moving us along. Um, is there anybody? I'm not seeing anybody putting up their hands who's willing to take that on at this time, Joe. Well, if you if you have a chance to look at it, and even if it's informal, any thoughts you have, if you'll pass them on to Anne, we will do our best to incorporate them. Uh, we've we're we're looking at other sources to get information on how to you know draft it or expand the scope or perfect it. Uh, we'll do our best, but again, we just want to be open so that you have a chance to see what we're doing and that you have an opportunity to communicate with us on it. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Okay, now. Uh, I can only, myself, I can only go for, it, it's 6.30 and I really, really have something else to do that I have to do tonight. So I think we had an overwhelming uh, packed meeting on an issue that right now is really front and center in terms of uh, what happened to Nataki and maybe what we can do about it in the future. And Joe, I very much appreciate you hanging in here for an extra hour and a half after your workday should be over, which it never is. Um, and hope that we can continue in December at our December meeting of these uh, about the welcoming project. Joe, you're putting up your finger. You just, must want to say something one thing. about it. I'll just say this very quickly. I don't know what a welcoming program is, but I'd like, you to, I'd like you all to start thinking about how do we, how do we convey the the uh, to our business to our businesses and to our community that we want to be open to any visitors who want to come here regardless of lifestyle or orientation or whatever uh, think about what you think a welcoming program for DEI would look like and uh, and then in December when we get back together let's talk about those ideas okay that would be great That's Joe really quick, really quick yes Gina can, may I email my liaison reports to Anne? Yes. And Anne, you can do it in a minute and share. Okay, fine. Great, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Gina. I think we would very much like to have people thinking about what a welcoming program would be like. Um, and might I suggest, is there anybody who's willing to sort of spearhead that idea? Precious, it, Precious is sticking up her hand. Okay. Anybody else in addition to Precious who is willing to spearhead that or Precious, can I leave it to you to wrangle ideas from the committee and sort of formulate them and get them to Joe or at least let us uh, have a formulation for a discussion in December for what the options could be. Yes, send me your ideas if you have ideas. No need to commit now, but I'm open to hearing your ideas. Thank you. Great, great. Okay, I really appreciate that. All right, Joe, so we are doing our best with uh, limited personnel, time, money, like everybody else in the world, um, and trying to both help as we can with DEI assessment and with the projects. And thank you very much for being here tonight. You bet. Thank, thank you. you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I, I'm apologizing for the uh, length of time that we took on the Nataki Garrett situation, but since we're since we're testifying publicly about it, you know, having the input from the people who are in the city and the police chief is really important. So that when people say, "Well, what did the people from the police department and Chief O'Meara have to say?" and Joe Lassard have to say about this, we have their answers, as opposed to just uh, sort of talking like we don't know what we're talking about, which is never a good thing. So thank you very much, everybody, for hanging in there for what I think was a really important meeting. Good night. Thank you. Good night.